What I'm going to talk about is development through art, and that's a, a can take that in a bigger picture. I've, I've been active in the Afghan community for the past 20 years. I worked in the United States, I worked in Afghanistan and some other countries. Uh, so, and uh, the structure of my, my talk is that I'll talk about, about what Afghan art is, and then a little background of what has happened, and then some recommendations through the experiences that I had. I came to know more about art through advocacy in community development when I was studying in the United States around 2001. There was a great need and a big uh, gap for an Afghan voice at the time. Because a lot of people were afraid to actually call themselves Afghan. I was, most of the time, I was one of the few or the only Afghan uh, to raise a banner saying I'm Afghan. People who are walking around me with the, these peace uh, movements and uh, peace walks, they were staying away from me because they might, I might get hurt or something. Uh, but I thought that uh, uh, it was necessary to put a voice in a face next to what Afghanistan actually is because it was so misrepresented. And actually not, not many people knew anything about it. Um, and I also wanted to use art as, as a way to bridge, uh, bridge uh, cultures and uh, to exemplify the 5,000 year history that Afghanistan had. When speaking with the artist, I realized that, um, Afghan, that, that art not only can be a source of healing in development, in building bridges, but at the same time, which is necessary for Afghanistan, a source of income. And I've tried in directly and indirectly to work towards that. So what is Afghan art? Now, in, in my humble opinion, it's the sum of all creative, static, and original artistic expressions made by a people of our land. That could be, that's just my opinion. There has been no research done on, uh, not that much research on what Afghan art actually is. Um, but from the context we know generally, you know, with some characteristics, what Afghan art is. And I will show you some of, some of that, that you know, throughout history. Well, you know, the, the, of course, some of those would be the Greco-Bactrian art, the Buddhas. We have, uh, in the medieval period, you have the school of Herat, the Timurid art, which are more fine arts. And then some familiar crafts, as you all know. Um, Herat glass, carpets, uh, pustines, and of course tiles and many, many, many other uh, things that, that you can encounter every day. Uh, you may not know about this part of Afghanistan. But what we're really proud of as Afghans, what really exemplifies Afghanistan as an art that came out of Afghanistan, it's unique to Afghan art, is, here you go. <clears throat> and it, it comes in different colors, it seems. Uh, it's a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, contribution of Afghanistan to the world uh, culture has been significant even if they're overlooked. This is not Mullah Omar. This is, uh, as you all know, uh, Maulana Jalaluddin Balkhi to the world known as Rumi, the founder of the whirling dervishes, a gift to, uh, from Afghanistan to the world. And he has been that for 800 years, a poet and Sufi master in whose artwork, I mean whose, whose poetry still sells a great deal, and he's the most sold poet in the world. And he's been dead for 800 years. And his uh, music speaks in many different languages because it's been interpreted in many different languages. Uh, and um, even artists actually sing his uh, songs. Well, anyway, to give you a little background of what has happened, uh, a little reality check based on my experiences. Now, when I, at the beginning, when I was talking about Afghan art to, to people, like beginning of 2002, uh, people uh, in, replied back to me in Afghanistan saying that Afghanistan needs art, uh, Afghani, art, uh, flour, that you make bread, and not art. To a certain extent, they might have been true. You know, at the time, they actually needed to look at the basic services. but. Most have forgotten that in the 30 years of war, especially in the refugee camps of Pakistan and even in Afghanistan, one of the major incomes of Afghans were carpets, one of the art and craft. 
And according to some statistics, it really varies, it employed one out of 10 Afghans directly or indirectly, which is a significant number because it means just one craft fed uh, one tenth of the population. If it has this much potential, then imagine what the rest of the arts and uh, crafts combined could do for a landlocked country that has you know, all these uh, geographical difficulties. <clears throat> of course, at those times, we had some of the places where actually selling uh, art was Chicken Street and some of the organization like Ashiana, CHA, and Dakar, and all of that. But by mid-2005, the demand for art has exploded. I mean, so much that the, the, the supply couldn't keep up with it. And of course, some dishonest merchants actually went to Pakistan and India, brought some of the art and saying, this is Afghan art. And that actually lowered the quality and prestige of Afghan art. And let me tell you a, a story that I have um, personally uh, seen. I was at this uh, camp, this uh, military camp, and there was different boots. I just wanted to see what, what people are selling and doing in there. There was this gentleman, uh, foreign gentleman, who was uh, buying, who was looking at uh, this one of the stalls or looking at, I don't know, some piece of pottery or something. He was, oh, this is beautiful, and, and told, uh, asked the, the merchant, who made this? And uh, the gentleman, the, the, the merchant told him, well, my father made it. He's like, oh, this is very nice, very nice. And he turns around, and at the back, it says, made in China. <laughs> so, Although the image of, of uh, you know, some, some of the image of, of uh, Afghan uh, art has suffered, but by, at that time, Afghanistan was hot. It was really, I mean, everybody would listen, uh, everybody would buy whatever said Afghanistan, reality. The, the, unfortunately, the government didn't take as much notice and didn't find this opportunity uh, uh, to be so great. But some of the donors, they actually made some investment in, in art. Um, which had some great uh, effects, but at the same time, it had, uh, it had some negative impacts or kickbacks, basically, draw, draw, drawbacks. And uh, I'll just mention some of those. One of them is they, what, what, what was happening was they were creating new institutions instead of working with the old institutions. So let's just say, imagine one particular uh, organization. They were funded a lot of money. They were just created new but they didn't have a base in the community and they were producing the same amount of quality of artists as was, let's just say, uh, Herat University of Fine Arts, the Faculty of Fine Arts, and Kabul University of Fine Arts. So they weren't doing anything different, just producing the same amount. So let's just say, if calligraphy has a $100,000 market per year in Afghanistan, and it was divided this 100,000 between 50 people or 100 people, now you have 200 people are dividing that same $100,000 without much broader um, uh, market being found for it. And um, also another, and, and th th this is all unintended consequences. These are things that you would like to help, but it has these sort of effects. So um, working with young artists, it's great young artists, let's work with, with the young artists. And they just you know, uh, try to support him by his or her art or craft or whatever it is. And he's uh, not usually younger, just like a student. But what they do is actually it breaks that master-apprentice relationship. That in order for, for an artist to become, to know all of the aspects of his art, has to have to a certain level. And, and then this, it creates a false illusions of what uh, that he, that he or she thinks that, oh, I'm, I'm a good artist now, and then once the, the, the work doesn't sell, or, or only a type of work sells, but nobody else actually understands the work, it becomes a little bit disillusional for him. And it's a problem because I, we encounter this all the time in the work that I have done, and I encountered it. And another unfortunate thing has been the best managers in Afghanistan are non-Afghans. It is great that at the beginning there was low skill, but now there's a lot of young, educated, experienced Afghan who can take the place of higher management in bigger companies. And I know this is happening, but I, but I think this was one of the problems before. And when the people, uh, non-Afghans, who were at the higher level of education uh, experience and, and, and those high um, management positions, when they actually leave, they take that experience and that abilities with them. They should be more Afghan-owned, I believe. And, um, 
on the institutional level, a lot of it's a lot of great work, and in, 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 uh, by no means it's uh, it's bad that they are trying to create this this institution. They try to, uh, to in, in inside Afghanistan, but they're just creating more NGOs that they're they're being entrepreneurial. So if you take out the funding, they just fall. So it needs to be whatever institutions are needs to be built. It needs to be built on solid grounds. It needs to be needed. One of these great examples, for example, is this, um, for example, these uh, private universities. Cardone University, various universities, they run solidly on, on Afghan funding. I usually, uh, usually say that there are maybe 100,000 foreigners, but there are 30 million Afghans. You need to look at that market so that whatever effort is in the money is spent and effort being done so that it stands on, uh, on the basic, uh, it doesn't fall, uh, fall through. So how can uh, art aid in development of Afghanistan? Now, in an ideal world, it's much better. It would be great if the government was in, uh, involved in all aspects. But since this is a relatively free country, um, we can uh, have institutions so, so that these institutions can, uh, can help with whatever that we're doing, the efforts we're doing. One of them, creation of a body, especially, especially in art, but um, creating a body that identifies and certifies masters. That who are the masters and how long in, in what needs um, what level of masters or what do you need to become this master? The other one was standardization and definition uh, of, of Afghan art in doing research of what Afghanistan and Afghan art is to distinguish itself from, from the neighbors. The other one, establishing a body for promotion of art and culture, although there's uh, EPO for this, but at the same time, it doesn't hurt to have other bodies that work simultaneously with, with this. I'm going fast because my time is uh, kind of up. Establishment of a network of shops that sells and promotes Afghan art. When I mentioned to you before that 10% uh, of the country is being fed by just one art, imagine that all these arts and culture, uh, arts and crafts combine, how much, they, how much employment they could bring in and how much prestige they could bring to the, to the country if the skill level is higher. So we don't need to create any shops. All we have to do is talk to the shops and just tell them around the world just saying that we have certified Afghan arts and crafts that are completely original, and they have all they have to do is just sell it. Um, and for that, we also need warehouses. Let's just say warehouses in, in North America, in Europe, Middle East. One of the major challenges for art to grow is actually having um, shipping. Shipping is very expensive. But if you have containers load going to these warehouses, and they're distributing it, to local shops, it doesn't matter, Afghan shops, non-Afghan shops, doesn't matter. They have it to do these shops that are selling it, it becomes much easier and then uh, the export picks up much, much better. And that's why it has been a, a big, big uh, problem for Afghans who cannot send outside. And creating uh, skills. Everybody here focuses on getting the illiterate to literacy. That is great. But what is needed is getting the literate educated to the higher level, we need masters. We need the higher level masters who can then be institutions who run this, uh, this country's art sector, or could be any other sector. I'm just speaking uh, from the art point of perspective. Um, exhibitions. Now, I'm not just talking about throwing an exhibition, people come and look at it. I'm talking about the exhibitions, the sort of things that people look at and say what the cutting edge of Afghan art is, to understand what are the new ideas and other artists come and learn. Other Afghans come and see how to use Afghan art to finally making art part of life. What does that mean? Now, we understand 15 years ago there was no cell phones in Afghanistan. We all know that. And people, most people didn't have any ideas. How did it become right now that, that, that so much of the people have penetrated, have, this, this, uh, the, have uh, at least one cell phone, if not more? It is because it found its place. It has become part of life. We can do the same thing. Herat Glass could become, uh, uh, with, with enough uh, investment, could become, let's say, part of Nauruz, could become part of the wedding ceremony. Same thing with, with the carpets or, or anything else, any art, uh, calligraphy, anything else. It, unless we make art part of life that has a domestic, strong domestic market, we can't actually succeed in, in, in promoting art to the level that we want, to the level that, that in the, the, its full potential as a source of income, it always remains very low. I think that's all. Thank you very much.